Check, check. Good afternoon, good afternoon. A nice chilly afternoon, plenty of coffee for you this morning. As we did last week, I'm going to give you a, my, my snapshot on a current event. Um, you are, um, you have heard of this meta, is that, you've heard of this meta? Yeah. Facebook is changing to meta. You're aware of that? What do you know about it? Um, I'll tell you what it is and you can share your thoughts on it. Meta is short for, I, if I believe this correctly, meta, meta universe or meta reality. Uh, you will put on a pair of goggles. You know, that, that d immerses you into a, a, an alternate universe. Um, it's like um, alternate reality or, you know, the things that back in the 80s were like sci-fi, maybe this will happen, you know, wouldn't this be crazy? Every, everything that you ever saw in other movies that used to be dystopian is now a reality, okay? So anything on Mad Max, remember that original Mel Gibson, Mad you know, you know that movie? It's a great movie. If you're ever bored on a Saturday afternoon, pop in Mad Max. It was, it was like this, uh, this over-the-top, post-apocalyptic scenario. And uh, we, we jokingly say that our, our reality is quickly turning into a Mad Max uh, reality. In any case, um, it, it's a little bit concerning on a couple of fronts. Um, number one, with the proliferation of video games nowadays um, and the... the the hyper-realistic nature, really, of video games. Uh, now, I play some of them. Don't get me wrong. I, I enjoy playing some video games. Um, but I don't struggle with, like, an addiction to it, right? So it's not for me. Um, th that's not been a temptation for me. Others, others do. In fact, they waste productive working years playing video games. Not to mention the the graphic nature of modern day video games, this is not Super Mario Brothers anymore. Um, this is hyper realistic, very graphic, very violent video games. Uh, that's not what Meta is, at least not yet. Meta is a world that you can immerse yourself in. You cover your eyes with a, a screen, you cover your ears with headphones, and you get to decide who you want to be, right? So you can. You can be male, female, uh, uh, rich, poor, fat, skinny, whatever you want. And then in, in Meta, supposedly, you can meet up with people at the cafe. Only it's digital. It's online, right? Uh, it's this world that you get to walk around in. Uh, looking ahead to the future, I, I worry about, like, um, haptic feedback suits. So they totally immerse you in this world where you can touch and feel things. Um, it's very, very creepy. <laughs> it's very creepy. Here's, here's the concern. Um, could, could reality, actual reality, become so difficult to deal with that you, instead of dealing with it, you escape to an alternate reality that you can construct the way you want? Um, that, I mean, finally, that's what TV is now. That's what video games are now. That's what the phone is now. All of these things, just like, uh, just like drugs or alcohol, help you escape, like escape the harsh realities of life. What happens if, if children who this, this, that's who really this is targeting, right? Uh, kids who grow up with this being normal. What happens if, if they begin to prefer that? <laughs> Over, over real life because real life is hard and it's harsh and instead I can go do this. Um, I don't know. Keep, your, keep that on your, in your prayers and on your mind. What, what happens if we, if, if we just completely bear... And wouldn't Satan just love that? Satan loves to give you a false reality. If he can control what you see and hear and feel and touch, he would love that. I have, I have often said I think that... Uh, I think that um, Satan loves uh, server farms. You understand what a server farm is? Server is a computer where all your information is on there. Okay, And these exist on the internet. They're huge, huge buildings, millions of square feet. It's where the internet exists. It's where the cloud is. Right? Satan can't read your mind, but he can read whatever you write down. Right? Wouldn't Satan just love to know all of your transactions and all of your purchase history and all everything you like and don't like because that just makes his job all that much easier. He can now target you and tempt you. 
um, that that always to me has been. I wonder if Satan can get into uh, you know Facebook and and kind of cruise around. You had something. Go. Yeah, I was thinking about those two girls who stabbed a third girl multiple times within the Milwaukee area. Well, Linderman. Linderman. Yeah. 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 I um, this was a couple years ago. Uh, the Slender Man that you're talking about. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they, they stabbed their friend or something because maybe Slender Man told them to, or if I'm remembering this correctly. Yeah. Um, what the undergirding of a of a of a of a child's uh, ability to think and rationalize and uh, become a stable, normal person is through parenting mom and dad in a, in, a, in a stable home. So what happens if you don't have stable homes anymore and then you subsequently it, you know, uh, just hammer these kids with alternate reality and, and just messed up entertainment? Um, it's no surprise that all of a sudden, I mean, the, the, the scary part is, can a, kid, can a kid distinguish between fact and fiction anymore? Reality and, and virtual reality, they start to blend together. Uh, that's some scary stuff. Uh, much of what we're seeing, I mean, even even phones, uh, we don't know how that affects the brain and how that affects the rewiring of the brain. They've mapped out the brain. They know that when you get uh, likes or text messages or social media posts, your brain lights up in the same areas that cocaine makes your brain light up. So this is an addiction. It, it, it triggers your pleasure centers. So that you 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 literally become addicted to the phone, addicted to the social media, and I think they might get that way on purpose. Beth, that's something. No, I was just going to say, aren't we seeing a little bit of that right now today with that Rittenhouse uh, murder trial? He was 17, and he went to this. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, he went right. to the scene, and he had a gun, so right. he was looking. For trouble, but now, now he's facing reality. He might spend the rest of his life in jail. Yeah. What um, what what goes through a person's mind that they say instead of staying away yeah. from riots, I'm going to go into riots. And she said, "Oh, I would never want him to go there." Well, obviously she didn't yeah. have control of him, and she didn't tell him that he went in. Yeah. Which, I mean, yep. Yeah. Yeah, we've got we've got a lot of holes in a lot of things. Follow. Um, she claims she didn't. I mean, that, they said that I told her. Never know. Yeah. yeah. But she we don't know what is true. So, so, so suffice to say that uh, the details continue to develop. Uh, these these kids that are involved in uh, in these riots and, and, and from last summer. I, did you ever go online and read the read the profiles of these kids that were arrested and things? So many of them literally lived in alternate realities. They had code names for each other that were often video game code names and things. So a lot of a lot of this rioting and things was kind of you're not it's not clear what did they consider reality and what did they think was just live action role playing, you know. Um, oh man, pray for the kids. Pray for the kids. Um, why is that? Why is that germane? Because uh, I think it's this weekend we're going to hear Pontius Pilate uh, say to Jesus, or maybe it's in the immediate context, "What is truth?" And it, and for Pilate, it's this kind of sarcastic, offhanded meaning that their truth is whatever I say it is. Right? Um, we live in a subjective reality now. We live in a, sub, a, a world with subjective morality and subjective truths. But the reality of things is that scripture is objective. It gives us the objective reality. Patrina, follow up, and then we're getting into the scriptures. <laughs> yes, I think um, with our media and play in all of our world today, we must be careful to discern uh, they prescribe motives and so forth yeah. to different people who are completely innocent. And you see this throughout especially now with governments uh, becoming more powerful, it's very hard to uh, know what is real out there. And before we impugn others, I just want to encourage us all to try to get out of that. Yeah, good, good. Um, let's jump into our text. We left off on uh, Acts chapter 6. Uh, we read through it briefly. In fact, um, I think you have a handout that had some open questions on that. Is that right? Acts chapter 6. 
Um, I don't want to belabor the chapter because we're going to get into 7, which is a longer one, but I don't want to breeze past chapter 6 either. Um, how about this, number 2? From Do you guys still have your handout from chapter 6? Yes. I'm looking at number 2. I like this one. After responsibility was taken off the shoulders of the apostles, something wonderful happened. What was it? So Acts chapter 6, we had the... The Greek-speaking Jews and the Hebrew, Hebraic Jews um, kind of at odds with each other. A reminder to us that um, cultural differences um, can often be um, bar real barriers that need to be actually dealt with. Um, so you've got cultural barriers, you've got language barriers perhaps, and uh, there's a gripe against one group over the other. I think it was the the, uh, the Hellenists or the Greek-speaking Jews came against the Hebrews, the, the Jewish ones, uh, because they were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. Uh, first of all, how did the apostles deal with that? Okay. All right, so we've got um, the appointment of seven people. So apparently, who was in charge of this up till now? Seems that the apostles were. Uh, but they're, they're growing now. They're getting to be a much bigger church. Um, so they're starting to have what, uh, what we affectionately refer to as big church problems. Uh, we've got some of those here. Big church has big church problems. Little churches have little church problems. Uh, we all have problems, right? <laughs> but we all meet God's grace in those problems. Um, so now the church has got some growing pains. Um, more and more believers are being added to their numbers. External, external pressures and external persecution cannot fracture the church. It only causes it to grow. But this is different. This is an internal problem. So we've got internal gripe between the believers. They dealt with it by appointing seven. Uh, and what did they say specifically? Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, you're looking at verse 3, right? Yeah, so high standards, good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and, and, and wisdom. Um, they're probably uh, looking ahead and saying, as the church gets bigger and we continue to butt heads with the, the established powers that be, they're seeing that anybody who's put into a leadership position in the congregation is going to have to be able to deal with Pro the inevitable conflict that's coming, right? And so they're not, they didn't ask for volunteers, right? They didn't run the ad in the bulletin. <laughs> hey, anybody want to take this thing over? Uh, sometimes that's perfectly appropriate. Sometimes you can run things in the bulletin. Uh, other times, no, we need to have a, a nominating process, right? We need to have the right person in the right, in the right seat, if you will. Um, and so they ask for nominations, and they set the qualifications. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom. And they come up with a, what I would say is a relatively short list. I mean, at this point, you've got, what, 5,000-ish in the congregation. So um, we've got the early church is now over twice the size of St. Mark's. And how many men did they find qualified to, to uh, serve in this position? Just seven. So you're, I don't know what that ratio is, but that's a, that's a small number. Seven guys in 5,000. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't more. There might have been more, but these are the seven that they have. Now, they hand off the responsibility to them, and what happens? What's the, what's the wonderful thing that happens? Church continues to grow. Yeah. Um, in, my, in my Bible, I have um, circled in verses... Uh, Two through seven, I have circled the word three times. So I have in the ESV, um, the disciples, I'm going to read through it. The, uh, the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word. So what's the apostles, the uh, chief concern? Preaching the word. We're not going to neglect that to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick up from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. 
And then you go down to verse 7, and here's the conclusion. When the apostles and the pastors devoted themselves to the word, the word of God continued to increase, meaning the preaching continued to get done, right? So the disciples uh, identify the two main um, uh, responsibilities of the called workers. What are they? The two main responsibilities? Preaching the word and? That's part of it. We'd say administering the sacraments and preaching and teaching are part of it. Prayer. Prayer. They're devoting themselves to prayer. Uh, so they are going to be the prayer prayers, the chief prayers, not meaning that no one else was doing that. They're going to be devoting the large swath of their time to praying and preaching and teaching. To this day, we'd say those are the main duties and responsibilities of the, of the ministers, the public ministers, the pastors, right? Of all the good things that there are to do, and there's a plethora of them, right? Of all the busyness that could be there, it is best to hand off what can be handed off to make sure that the pastors are devoting the large swaths of their time to preaching and teaching and praying. Uh, one of the big church problems that big churches have, too much work needs to get done. And so oftentimes as a pastor, you, you, have to, you have to literally block off your calendar and shut the door to the office and, and take the phone off the hook, <laughs> right? I am studying the word right now. I am praying right now. And I'm going to be preparing my Bible classes and my sermons uh, because you might... Um, you might not notice if, uh, you know, I don't get, return your phone call or your email for, for 24, 48, 72 hours. You might not notice that. <laughs> Guarantee you I get in the pulpit and say, yeah, I don't really have a sermon ready for you. <laughs> You're going to notice that. Uh, you come to Tuesday Bible class and, and you know, and we're in and out in 15 minutes because I haven't prepared a, a, a lesson. Yeah, you're going to notice that, right? So it's no, it's no surprise. When the apostles devoted themselves to the word and prayer, the inevitable conclusion, the word of the Lord increased. Carol, I think I saw your hand. No. <laughs> I count on it, Carol. I count on it. Um, I thought I saw a hand. No? All right. Um, let's see. Uh, synagogue of the Freedmen. Um, what other questions do you want? Oh, how about number five? You wrestle with number five. Because this asks you. What can you do to make sure your pastors are, um, are uh, devoting themselves to prayer and the word? What can you do? I'll give you a hint. You're doing it right now. <laughs> No, not be quiet. <laughs> I mean, that's not a bad idea, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Leave me alone. Yeah. Ministry is much easier with you people out of the way. Yeah. Um, you're doing it right now. Yes. Yeah, show up, right? Uh, if people are coming to worship and coming to Bible class, uh, then I have some work to do. Right? Then, I, then I'm prepared, then I'm ready to give you the word of God. If no one comes to worship, I don't have a sermon to write. Right? No one's coming to Bible class or we just don't offer the Bible. Well, okay, <laughs> it's not really working. Okay, what else can you do? So attend. Good. Carol? You have to sort of front end and front end and back end load that stuff. You people, you guys, you gals need to be supported. You need the, the ah. all for your life. But on the other side, we need to make sure that you are up to snuff. <laughs> okay, you're right. Yeah. So you on the on the one hand, I think you were, I think I heard you talking about like salary offerings. You need to pay me to not have a job, right? I mean, that's that's really what the what your offerings are. Uh, you pay me so I don't have to have a job. Right? You pay me to study and preach and teach. Full, that's my full time call. Good. And then I think your other one was up to snuff. And that's a great way to say it, because there's really two. There's really two things that I hear you saying in there. Number one, you got your ears tuned in during the sermon and during Bible class, and you're saying, "Boy, you better be giving us the Word of God in truth and purity." And I maybe I'd be hearing you say like a continuing education. You have an expectation that that we continue to grow in our studies, so that 
We're like, as the scriptures say, the, the steward that brings out of his storehouse treasures both old and new. So we're giving you the, the old scriptures with fresh insights and perspective, right? Treasures old and new. Is that fair? Did I sum up what you said fairly? Yeah, because we're, we're pretty used to top-notch stuff around here. Yes, we are. Sure. <laughs> sure. I understand. Imagine, imagine walking out of seminary into St. Mark's pulpit. <laughs> And you're looking down and you're seeing Professor Deutschlander. And you're, <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to preach to him. Oh, what a kind man. He was always such a kind man. I always liked to rib him a little bit because uh, later in life he had, he, his eyes would water. And so he would have to take off his glasses, you know, and, and use a Kleenex. And so I, I always kind of ribbed him. I saw I got you with that sermon, didn't I, Professor? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he always made sure we knew, hey, it's not your preaching, Pastor. It's uh, the medicine or whatever. You know? <laughs> it was a good man. I look forward to seeing him again in heaven. All right. Uh, so we've got a ministry of the word. And, and um, you're right to, to wrestle with that. The other chief thing you can do. Right. I heard it, yes, pray. I mean, really, really pray. Um, as, as, much as, um, as much as the work of the ministry is, is preaching and teaching to, to the members and making sure they're fed, it also means that we're, by and large, we're the, we're the biggest target to aim at, right? <laughs> we're the biggest target to aim at from the world's perspective. Um, uh, clergy don't necessarily have a good name and a good reputation in the world. Um, and, and some of it because other clergy have ruined that, and some of it just because the inerrant sinful nature doesn't respect or, or uh, want God's word. So, yeah, always have your eye on that. Uh, what's your role in the ministry at St. Mark's? Uh, if you're not asked to, to write sermons or teach the Bible classes, it doesn't mean you don't have a, a role in the ministry and making sure it happens. Sometimes the role is smaller. Sometimes you're, you're sitting in the nursing home and your role is just spend all your time praying. Other times your role is much bigger. Um, you, maybe you can, uh, you, you can step in and do, uh, do some classwork or something like that. Perhaps you can. You should always be wrestling with that and, and looking to engage. I mean, finally, the same my church. <laughs> this is your church. I just give you God's word. You decide the rest, right? What else do you want to say about uh, Acts chapter 6? Acts chapter 6. Randy. Verse 7, I may have the NIV version, but it, it closes by saying, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now I interpret that as being Old Testament Jews, priests that were <coughs> in the Old Testament Jewish mm -hmm. theology, converted to the new, the new, yeah, because you actually became Christians out of that. And, and to me, that, that's a big statement in there, because they had to be people of influence. I would say yeah. at one time, and, it, and as they converted, that had to have huge ramifications on the number of others around them. That, that Is that safe? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. These would have been the priests in the temples, uh, or the priests in the, in the uh, Old, Old Testament um, sacramental system or sacrificial system, rather, uh, that heard the gospel. And those were probably the particularly hard-fought and hard-won victories. Um, God's Word did amazing things in converting their hearts. But yeah, that, that's not a small statement. Um, you know, I, I just read in, somebody had shared a headline, a Lutheran minister um, converting to Islam. I mean, and you go, wow. So, but even in the world's eyes, that's a headline-making event. Right, even that uh, that that conversion because it's shocking. It's just shocking, and for us in the wrong way, right? In this case, it was shocking in the right way. Wow, he, they're coming over now. Up to this point, by and large, Christianity is viewed as a sect of Judaism. Um, even the Romans weren't quite sure what what are you talking about when you're talking about these rabble rousing apostles and what what do they believe now? And isn't that just a, a little sub pocket of Judaism? Um, they're starting to realize, ah, this is something completely different. And yeah, the, the priests come over. Uh, on the other hand, uh, given the priests' um, knowledge of the Old Testament and their interaction with that sacrificial system, their, their minds must have been blown. 
as they as they see let's say 30 40 years worth of their cre- priestly career and then all of a sudden they start to see it fulfilled in Jesus and they're going holy smokes i've been sacrificing that that lamb for 40 years and <laughs> Look at this. I mean, they knew the detail. Did you ever read the, the Old Testament and you, you struggled to understand all the little details? And you're like the offering and the wave offering and the grain offering and the whole burnt offering. And the and, and it's like at, at this festival and that festival. To us, it's we have to struggle for that knowledge to try and recreate, if you will, the old system and see how it was fulfilled. Priests didn't have to do that. They knew these offerings like the back of their hand. And all of a sudden, they're seeing them fulfilled in Jesus. That must have been cool. That must have been really cool. Um, and then I think about all the preaching that that Old Testament priest could do now. Think of the insights he would have as he sees the fulfillment from a Jewish perspective in, in Jesus. Boy, he must have had a powerful testimony. How that work with the, with the Jews then? If they're seeing their priests now leaving. Well, good question. Good question, and we're going to get into, well, I, we've already kind of read it, but go into um, eight, uh, verse 8 through the end. Now, up until this, remember, we've had the, we've had the, Jew, uh, the Christians um, increasing in popularity. So the people were very receptive to, to the Christian message. Some of them trusted it. Others probably didn't trust it, but they loved it that this went in the face of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because the, the establishment, right? We all kind of like that underdog story. And we knew that Gamaliel, who was honored by the people, also said, leave the Christians alone. So the, the Christians are revered for one reason or another by most of the people. Um, and many of them probably followed their priests over. Some of, some of that 5,000 number came over, right? But now something happens. Um, I'm going to read... Uh, 8 through the end of chapter 6. Now Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Now here we go. Verse 9. Some men who are from what is called the synagogue of freedmen, so these are other Jews, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they were unable to stand up against his wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. Then they secretly induced some men to say, we heard Stephen speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders, and the experts in the law. So notice the three groups. So because they, this is so typical, right? If you can't, if you can't uh, wage war uh, openly against your enemy, you need to go to secret covert operations, right? So they try to wage overt war against Stephen, but they find we can't stand up against his, um, his knowledge in the spirit. So they're going to switch gears. They're going to go to covert operations, and they start what we in modern-day terms would call a PR campaign. So this is a slanderous PR campaign that they're lying about him. Well, are they? We're going to look at that in a minute. And it's very effective because it stirs up the people, the elders, and the experts in the law. Previously, they were unwilling to arrest the disciples, but now it says they came, dragged Stephen away, and brought him before the Sanhedrin. So obviously, these people that were arguing with Stephen and were against the Christian message were very effective. They go from being afraid to arrest the apostles in public in chapters 4 and 5 to now publicly dragging away Stephen. So they were able to win over at least... Maybe a majority of the people, maybe almost a majority of the people who previously were either supportive or at worst ambivalent towards Christianity. But the PR campaign here appears to hit its mark and, uh, and they drag him away. Um, and here's their, so here's their accusations. Keep these in mind as we get into Stephen's speech or sermon now coming up. Here's their accusations. They presented false witnesses. Uh, so, first of all, we, we get an introduction to their accusation in chapter or verse 11. We heard Stephen speaking blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And now they elaborate on what that means. The false witnesses in chapter, verse 13 said, This man never stops making threats against this holy place and the law. In fact, we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, meaning the temple, and will change the customs Moses handed down to us. So um, 
sounds very similar to the same testimony that um, condemned Jesus to death, right? They produced false witnesses that said, we heard him say he'll tear down this temple and rebuild it in three days. And then we as the readers of the scripture learned Jesus was talking about his body, but they used that as testimony against Jesus. They're doing the same thing against Stephen. Now, let's look at their accusation. They're false witnesses who said this man never stops making threats against this holy place and the law. In fact, here's what we mean. We heard him say that Jesus will destroy this place. Let's pause there. Did Jesus say that he would destroy the temple? Think very carefully. Close. What exactly did he say? That his body was Okay, that... That there's a reference to his body. There's one other occasion. He said it would be destroyed. Okay. Yeah. In fact, he said not one stone will be left on top of another. So did he say that he would destroy the temple? No. Did he say that the temple would be destroyed? Yes. Yeah. So you see what these false witnesses are doing? They're taking an element of truth and twisting it. And then what's their other, what's their other accusation? Uh, he will change the customs Moses handed down to us. Did Jesus change the customs Moses handed down? Sure. Yes. Of course he did. You don't sacrifice sheep and bull anymore, right? Uh, so of course he did. The question is, is Stephen the first one that begins to champion that? Is Stephen the pioneer that finally starts looking into the future and understanding the implications of preaching the gospel? Or do these enemies of Jesus understand the gospel better than others have? And they themselves can look ahead and see, well, if what Stephen says is true, then why do we need the temple? And if what Jesus said was true, then why do we need the law of Moses? They're coming to the correct conclusion. I mean, really. The problem is, of course, they're rejecting it. I'm wondering if the apostles and other Christians were still bringing sacrifices. I know they went to the temple at the hour of prayer. Were they still bringing sacrifices? I don't know. Uh, I haven't studied that enough to know. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Um, you, when, when Martin Luther had that, when the Reformation happened, remember that communion was being only served in one kind of the people. They only got the bread, never the wine. Uh, there's still some Catholic churches, I think, that do that uh, nowadays, but they kind of get to choose. <laughs> um, uh, there was a pastor in, uh, I think it was Wittenberg, is that where Bugenhagen was? And Bugenhagen, he said, you must immediately, right now, give the people bread and wine. And Luther said, not yet. We, it'll burden their consciences. They've never had the wine before. They don't know what's going on here. In fact, you, you might get them to just say, I'm not taking it all because now I'm not sure what it is. Well, you don't want to do that. So there's a period of loving patience where you need to allow for growth and learning to happen. If the Christians were still bringing some sacrifice, I mean, after all, we know they're meeting in Solomon's colonnade. They're still going to the temple. We still know that Peter and uh, John, when they healed the blind man, or the, they healed... They were going at the hour of prayer. So they didn't, they didn't do this with the temple. And they, and they didn't do this with the law. They still very much were in the cycle of what they had been doing. Um, the, the natural breaking will occur. And in fact, it's probably one of the reasons why Jesus, God made sure that the Romans did knock down the temple. What damage would it do if the temple was still standing? What if people were still insisting, we've got to go do this, we've got to go do this? Um, somebody asked last week, how, how did the Jews justify uh, rejecting Jesus and not partaking still in the sacrifices? Um, I think, did you ask me that? Yeah. My answer was probably because the temple's not there, that they, you know, they, they wouldn't partake in it. I don't know. But um, it explains why God knocked the temple down. We're done with that now. I mean, he showed us that. Um, so there you have the accusations against Stephen. Now, let's let Stephen speak for himself. Uh, he answers now in chapter 7. Uh, if you read this ahead of time or if you kind of looked at it, you'll know this is a pretty lengthy, uh, lengthy chapter. This is the uh, single longest speech that is recorded in the book of Acts. Okay, so um, is it a speech? Is it a sermon? A lot of people have wrestled with what, what exactly is this that Stephen is doing here. Um, 
Uh, let's read a little bit of it. And uh, I'm going to read first through... Um, where is my sheet? Ah, too much going on up here. I need a bigger podium. Um, oh, I printed off the wrong ones. All right, seven. Um, let's just get reading into seven. All right, so here we are. Uh, they look at uh, verse 15 at the end of se uh, six. All those who were sitting in the Sanhedrin were looking intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So glowing, probably glowing. There's one other time that a face glowed. Do you remember? Yes. Moses, on what occasion? Yes, after he comes down getting the Ten Commandments. Yeah, but what, what did he do with his face, do you remember? Why did he cover it? He didn't want them to see it. So they wouldn't see it fake. Yeah, he didn't, because that was a sign that the, 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 the powerful covenant of the law that he had just received was going to be replaced. It's going to fade away. But they didn't get to know that yet. Because for them, it was going to be a lifelong covenant. So cover the face, right? So now we have the face of Stephen glowing. And no surprise, we're going to read about Moses coming up. We're going to see a lot of parallels drawn now. Um, okay, then the high priest asked, are these things true? The high priest, some debate, is not, he's like the judge. Judges do not get to do the um, questioning. They don't get to ask the question. So should he have asked this or not? Is this official or not? We don't really know. Stephen said, gentlemen, brothers, and fathers, listen. Well, how, re how respectful. Not you rabble rousers. Gentlemen, <laughs> brothers, and fathers, listen. The, the God of glory appeared to our father, our father. What's he doing? What's he making a point to, to say? I'm one, of you. I'm one of you. I'm not some breaking off dissident here. I'm one of you. Our father Abraham, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, God said to him, leave your land and your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After his father died, God, gave, God had him move from there to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance in this land, not even enough to set his foot on. What's, what's, what does he mean by that? Didn't he give him the inheritance? What does he mean that God did not give Abraham an inheritance? Did Abraham ever get to live in the land of Canaan as an owner? He died. He, uh, in Hebrews, we're told that these great heroes of faith never actually received the gifts, promises. They, uh, ap they, uh, they apprehended them, I think is one of the words, from afar and received it by faith. So in faith, he trusted that it would be his inheritance and that his offspring would live there, which meant he had to, have, he had to trust two things. One, that God would give the land. Two, that he'd have offspring. Yeah, okay. Uh, he gave him no inheritance in the land, not even enough to set his foot on. But God promised to give it as a possession to him and to his descendants after him, even though Abraham still had no child. There in faith he had to trust he would have a child. God revealed that his descendants would live as strangers in a foreign country. What country? Egypt. And that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. God added, I will judge the nation that they serve, that they will serve as slaves, and after that, they will leave there and serve me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. So Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs, filled with envy sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Let's pause there for a second. So we're talking first about Abraham. And what is Stephen establishing about Abraham? What's he showing, Randy? The covenant made with Good. the Jewish people all through Abraham. Yes, exactly. He is, he is first and foremost establishing, here are the basic promises that we were given as Jews, right? Here is where it started with Abraham. All right, then he's going to move surprisingly into Joseph. Uh, so Joseph in Egypt, but God was with him. Verse 10, God rescued him from all his troubles and granted him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 
And Pharaoh made him governor over Egypt and over his whole palace. A famine came over all of Egypt and Canaan, causing great suffering. And our fathers found no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited his father, Jacob, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 people in all. Jacob went down to Egypt, uh, and there he died, he and our fathers. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Was that Machpelah? No, does Jacob buy Machpelah? I think that's Sarah. Yeah, he buries Sarah yeah, in Machpelah, right? The cave of Machpelah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, that's proof there. The fact that he had to buy the cave means he didn't own any property. Okay, so he didn't get an inheritance. He had to buy that. As the time approached that God spoke about in the promise he had made to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt. This continued until another king who knew nothing about Joseph became ruler of Egypt. He took advantage of our people in a cunning way, and he mistreated our fathers by forcing them to get rid of their babies so that they could not survive. They would not survive. Interesting that the scriptures explicitly say what happens when you get rid of your babies. What happens? You do not survive. Um, that is the logical outcome of our aborting uh, society, of our, of our, our abortions, 55 billion or whatever were aborted. We will not survive. We've killed the next generation. 55 million babies dead. Never forget that. That is, the, all of that blood, all of that blood, cries out to God, all oh, 55 million. That is sick. Um, it's probably higher than that by now. I don't even know. I'll look it up sometime. That's the next generation. Oh, we, won't, we won't survive or recover. We've killed the next generation. How could we possibly? Um, in any case, uh, what's, what, is, what is Stephen doing? First of all, he's showing that he has extensive knowledge of Old Testament biblical history. So you cannot possibly make the charge against Stephen that he doesn't know what he's talking about, he's breaking off from Judaism that he doesn't even understand. Well, he's clearly showing an in-depth in understanding. He's also going to show us um, that he is um, speaking under the power of the Holy Spirit because he's going to give us new details we didn't know. You say, well, how did Stephen know that? God was revealing it to him during, during his speech here. Uh, the other pattern that he's going to start developing now, watch very closely for it, the habitual rejection by the Jews of God's chosen leaders. What did he point out? Who sold Joseph into slavery? His own brothers. Who were his brothers? Yeah, they were the very 12 tribes of Israel, right? So the very... First generation of the patriarchs, of, of the, like the Israelites, the Jews, sold their own brother into slavery after they were told that he would be uh, receiving the promises. Remember, he has those, those dreams, the other stocks bowing down to him, and, and they reject it out of hand. Just knowing in verse 9, and 40, what you just said, you also highlighted the jealousy that was driving Good. Well, because that was so apropos of what was happening right in front of us. We got owls, we got a Okay, owls are heading out. So if you're going to owls, fly away, fly away. Fly the coop. That's right, fly the coop. Um, so he's showing now, uh, in Stephen's defense of himself, he's starting to establish this, uh, this rejection, um, which in the end we're going to hear, Stephen turns the tables. It's not me rejecting. It's you rejecting, just like your fathers before you. All right, um, we are at uh, verse 20. At that time, Moses was born, and he was favored by God. For three months, he was cared for in his father's house. After he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in his words and actions. Um, I want you to note in your mind... Um, where is the, uh, what do they call, what does he call Moses? Powerful in what? Yeah, powerful in his words and actions. What did he say about Joseph? 
God was with him, granted him favor and wisdom. What did we say about the seven men who were chosen to do this uh, distribution of bread? They must have what? Wisdom and power. So Stephen, we know, has wisdom and power. Joseph, wisdom and favor. Moses, powerful words and actions. Starting to show connections between Joseph, Moses, Stephen. Okay? Um, but when he was 40 years old, it entered his mind to visit his brothers, the sons of Israel. So, by the way, this is how we know that Moses knew that he was a Hebrew, even as he's raised in Pharaoh's household. So Moses knew who he was. Uh, so he goes out to visit him when he's 40. When he saw one of them being mistreated, he defended him and avenged the oppressed man by striking down the Egyptian. He thought that his brothers would understand that God was giving them deliverance by his hand. But they did not understand. What was Moses trying to do in that instance? Rescue. He's trying to ignite a rebellion and rescue. Yeah. So actually, the, the Exodus, the story of Exodus, that is the second, <laughs> the second attempt at rescuing, and it's a successful one. In this first attempt, God didn't tell Moses to do that. There was no call. There was no go and do this. Moses, young, brash, 40-year-old Moses, bite up my hand and my arm. Boom, I killed the Egyptians. There, let's go. And crickets, right? <laughs> so this time he's mighty in speech and he's ready to go. When God finally did call him, much time later, he said, I don't speak very well. And what happened? What did God need to do to Moses first? Humble him. Humble him. I have never heard that he was trying to start. I didn't really tell him with this. How do we know this? How do you say that? Ah, right. How do we know that? Yeah. Stephen told us. <laughs> right here. This is how we know. <laughs> you just read it. Um, and the only reason Stephen knows that, God's revealing it. That's why I said Stephen's got details that, that we didn't know before. And all of a sudden he just puts it on the table and states it like fact. Well, how did that happen? Well, he's prophesying. He's got divine insight here. Okay. I didn't before. That's okay. That those verses, giving them deliverance by his hand. It's like, I saw that as just a single issue, but I see it now as trying to appeal to his brothers. Yeah, yeah. He's... Um, it says right here, verse 25, he thought that his brothers would understand. God was giving them deliverance by his hand, but they did not understand. And so we're kind of left to wrestle with like, okay, was the issue with the people and they were supposed to go and they didn't? Or is the issue with Moses and he was trying to get them to go and he shouldn't have been doing that? I, I propose the, the former, that uh, Moses was kind of, I'm, I'm going to be the rescuer now and had to wait another 40 years before God said, okay, now go back. So was he... He wasn't planning this before he did the act. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, like... Or was it his cover-up? Oh, I did this, so now, you know, this is what... Right. Is, I want other people to... Was it, what, was it, was it premeditated? Was it, um, was it, I'm going to try and strike while the iron's hot? You know, I, it just, this happened and now let's go? Don't know. But we're told that, we're told that, here's what he thought. He thought he was going to start the rebellion right there, and he was going to rescue him right there. But God runs things on his timetable, not anyone else's. So he had to wait now another 40 years. Um, in fact, it tells us what happened next. Uh, the next day, verse 26, he came across two of them while they were fighting, and he tried to reconcile them. He said, men, you are brothers. Why are you harming each other? But the one who was harming his neighbor pushed him, Moses, away saying, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me the same way you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this remark, Moses fled and lived in a, as an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. So he's, uh, he's found out. Why does, he, he runs. I mean, that's, he just runs. And he's going to be out in Midian for 40 more years. And here's what it says. After 40 years had passed, so now he's 80, 
How many of you at 80 have the energy to lead the Exodus? <laughs> Cross the Red Sea, climb Mount Sinai, walk for 40 years in the desert. You got it in you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, with sandals on. Yeah, not known for their arch support, are they? Uh, <laughs> um, when Moses saw, when uh, I'm sorry, uh, after 40 years had passed, the angel of the, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the wilderness at Mount Sinai, in the flames of a burning bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. He went closer to look. The voice of the Lord said, "I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob." Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sand the sandals off your feet, because the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning. I have come down to rescue them. Now come, I will send you to Egypt. And here's his main point. This is the same Moses they had rejected. By saying, who made you a ruler and judge? This is the one whom God sent to be a ruler and deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him at the bu in the bush. So again, establishing, he's saying, oh, yeah, your forefathers were so noble. Don't forget, they rejected Moses once upon a time before they ever followed him. So they, they, they rejected Joseph. Sold them as slavery. They rejected Moses. And now, who made you to be ruler? Well, now, now Moses can say, God did. <laughs> he sent me here, right? This is the one who led the people out as he performed wonders and miraculous signs in Egypt, at the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the people of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. Meaning? Jesus. Jesus. This is the one who was in the assembly of the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living messages to give us. We call that the law. There's the law, the living message to give to you. But our fathers refused, there it is again, refused to obey him. Instead, they pushed him away and turned back in their hearts to Egypt. They wanted to go back to slavery. They told Aaron, make gods for us who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. There was a time when they made a calf, offered a sacrifice to the idol. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, offered a sacrifice to the idol and were taking delight in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to the worship of heavenly bodies, as it was written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me slaughtered animals and sacrifices for 40 years in the wilderness, house of Israel? No. You even look up to the tent of Moloch. And the star of your God, Raphan, the statues you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. So now he's looking ahead, promised land, and then post-promised land. Now I'm going to punish you for that. Okay? Um, there are three sort of main pillars of Jewish piety. The three main pillars are the land, the land, the law, and the temple. Those were the things that the Jews were most proud of. The land, the law, and the temple. And Stephen, in the first part, talked about the land. Here's the promise of the land. And you almost rejected it. Your fathers almost rejected it. And now he just, got, he just broached into the topic of uh, the temple when he said living words. So I'm sorry, of the, the law. So you know, he's hit the land. He's hit the law. You almost, you almost rejected that. And now he's going to get finally into the temple. So he is taking out the, the kind of the three main pillars of, of Jewish piety. That's what he's showing here, how, how the, the Old Testament is now going to collapse. Okay? Our fathers had the tent of testimony in the wilderness. Here he goes about the temple. It was just like the mo model Moses had seen. When did Moses see a model of the tabernacle? Or the temple? On the mountain. On the mountain, as God is giving him the directions of how to build this thing. Uh, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it. After our fathers received it from him, they brought it in with Joshua when they took possession of the land from the nations God drove out before our fathers, meaning the tabernacle. It was here until the days of David. He found favor in the presence of God. 
and asked that he might obtain a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands, just as the prophet said, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What sort of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is my resting place? Did not my hand make all these things? So what's Stephen saying about the temple? You think, you think God needs you to keep the temple, otherwise he's homeless? Is that what you think? If God didn't have the temple, he's homeless? That's what they're thinking. And here's, the, here's his conclusion. You stiff-necked people. Ho, oh, ho, hello. Here we go. With uncircumcised hearts and ears. That's a jab. These were the circumcised people. And they were proud of it, darn it. You uncircumcised hearts and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. You are doing just what your fathers did. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who prophesied the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You who received the law as transmitted by angels, but did not keep it. When they heard these things, they were furious, gnashed their teeth at him. That's something the wicked always do to the righteous. Teeth gnashing, always done by the wicked towards the righteous. <laughs> But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What did Jesus say during his trial? You will see greater things than these. You will see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And what did Stephen just see? He's fulfilling that. He just saw it. But they screamed at the top of their voices, covered their ears, and rushed at him with one purpose in mind. They threw him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses laid their cloaks at, a, at the feet of a young man named Saul, who we know later as Paul. Uh, so he's there giving his approval to this. As the fact that they're laying his cloaks at their feet, by the way, says that he probably is the, the chief leader of this. So it's not like he's just involved. It's like, no, he's the guy. He's the guy. Okay. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I want you to listen carefully for echoes of the crucifixion. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell on his knees and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. After he said this, he fell asleep. Don't you just hear the crucifixion all over again? Lord, receive my spirit, my soul, my breath. It's all the one word. Ruach, Ruach is the, is the name in, in, in Hebrew. Pneuma is the name in Greek. Those both mean wind, breath, spirit, soul, all kind of, in, all kind of together. So we're given this sort of, I don't know, there's some mystery here. Like, what is your soul? It's, it's you, but when it leaves your body, your body's lifeless. So your, your thinking and your reason and your rationality and your personality all appear to be contained in your soul. Because we know that when the soul departs the body, all of those things stop happening in the body. So when the body and the soul separate, which was never supposed to happen, and the soul goes to heaven without the body, what exactly is that? Are you cognizant? Are you aware? Are you you before the throne of glory, before you get your body back? The answer is yes. Yes, it is you. It is ego, the ego, the me, the I. I am before the throne of grace, the thinking, rationalized being. I, this is so hard. We don't comprehend things this way, right? But there's your soul before the throne of grace, and you are at perfect peace, and you are in paradise, and it's never going to change for you except the day when you get your body back again. Then your soul is going to be put back together with your body. It's the great undoing, the undoing of death. Okay, So that uh, the scriptures say the last enemy to be conquered is death. And when you get your body back together, now you are permanently and perfectly restored to the way you should have been. And your body will never deteriorate again. Uh, so, as Paul says, uh, at the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the dead will be raised, and we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, 
and uh, the, the, the mortal must clothe itself with immortality and the perishable with imperishability. And when the immortal has been clothed with mortality and the perishable with imperishability, then the saying which is written shall come true. Where, O death, right, is your sting. Did you have a follow-up? I saw you doing this. No. Ellen, are you? No, yes, no. 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 Okay. Because uh, I was on a roll. Now you ruined it. No. <laughs> I also find this interesting. Um, after he said this, he fell asleep. What do, what do you make of that? What do you hear when you hear that? Yeah, he, he died. Um, did God literally let him fall asleep and sleep through his own painful death? Was that a, was that a mercy of God at that point? And, um, that he says, okay, Stephen, your body is going to die now. But I'm not... I'm not going to let you, I, I'm not going to make you kind of like suffer through that, right? So this is what's going to happen to your body is going to be uh, this terrible. I mean, I've never seen a stoning, but you can only imagine how somebody dies after heavy objects are piled on them. That can't be pretty. Uh, that can't feel good. Um, you ever had a dirt cloud torn in the back of your head by your brother? <laughs> oh, right? Or a rock. I mean, imagine that, but five times heavier, right? Um, so did God, did God in his mercy take Stephen's soul out of his body like a little bit early or let him sleep through it and then received him into glory? Maybe, but whatever it is, it's this beautiful scene where, where Stephen's going to die for his faith, but God lets him see heaven first. I mean, what a reassurance. Don't you hope to see that uh, before you die? Um, oftentimes there are stories of, of people that are dying all of a sudden like sitting up in bed or gasping and saying angels or Jesus and then they die. That's beautiful. Uh, that, that was the word of when my great-grandfather was dying 20 some odd years ago um, that, that he was out of it and out of it and out of it and woke up and said, angels. And you go, Wow. He, you know, the, he saw the angels coming to take his soul. That's what happens. The angels take you home. They will usher you into heaven. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And then you just get to be like that, perfect, until you get your body back. You never have to worry about anything ever again. Um, you just got to make it through that, that phase. And that's the hard part. <laughs> that's the hard part. Um, I, none of us are afraid what happens after death. I mean, it's, it's the dying part that kind of freaks us out a little bit, right? Uh, but understand that no matter what it is that takes you out of this world, I don't know what it is or what it will be, obviously, Christ will undo it. He will, he will undo it. Uh, so you, you have to fall asleep, right? You don't die. You, you're, just, you're just asleep for a while, and then you can come back. And then we're all going to come back, and we're all going to be together. It's going to be great. It's just the hard part of getting there, right? Unless you're Lazarus, then you've got to go on and come back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what what comments do you have? Five minutes over, so if you got to sneak out, don't don't uh, be afraid to do um, so. Yeah, you've heard it said that before these people learn it in the word, they are steeped in the scriptures. I've heard it said that before um, the Messiah was on the train is seated at the right hand. Of God. Yeah. Now he says he's standing. Was that a, a threat? You know, um, if he's standing, he's going to about to do. Yeah, um, a, a lot have kind of pontificated on that. What, what's up with this vision of Jesus standing versus being seated at the right hand of God? I don't know that we can make too much of it other than what I hear. When I hear that is the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. You will see the Son of God at, standing at the right hand of the Father. Um, that's what I hear when I when I hear that. So, can we make too much of the difference between seated and standing? At some point, I just say God can sit down or stand up whenever He wants, right? <laughs> so in this case, you want to stand there. Um, yeah, this 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 is the the ultimate blasphemy, right? And notice notice that there is no judgment rendered, right? So there's no ruling. There's no ruling. This is mob justice. This is 100% mob justice. So the judge, the high priest, did not say guilty or innocent. They just lost the trial to chaos, and they, and, they, and they killed the guy. And they didn't solve anything, right? Because the gospel kept being preached. So way to go. You send them home to heaven, and then we won anyway. So, you know, you didn't accomplish anything. 
I'm gonna wait, Uncle Bob, until you're like halfway. Then I'm gonna start praying, and then I'm gonna see what you're gonna do when you're halfway up the. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I was at a I was at a conference. Don't you hate that? You walk into a room and it turns out they're all praying and you're like, uh, not sure what to do. Right. I was at a conference once and all the pastors they wouldn't shut up. You know, lo and behold, pastors can really talk, right? And so the presenter, instead of telling them to be quiet, he just says, "Let us pray." <laughs> just just watch them all stand there awkwardly. Um, what questions do you have? Yes. I, I'm just thinking, uh, maybe because he was standing, it told he was actively looking out for, for yeah. Stephen and taking. Yeah. Could could communicate you can, readiness. You can take whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's close with prayer, and then if you got follow up, so you can catch me after. All right, we'll pray. Father, thank you for your mercies that you showed to your servant Stephen, who was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. You sustained him in the hour that he was called to give witness. You gave him strength and insight and wisdom to answer every objection. And then, Lord, in your mercy, you allowed him a vision of heaven before taking him there. Lord, in your mercy, uh, be with us as the hour of our death continually approaches day by day. Make, a, make us as bold as Stephen for the day of our death. And then meet us with your grace on that day. And do not let us labor long, but just take us home and send the angels to bring us through those gates into glory. Lord, give us the knowledge and the assurance and the peace of knowing that we'll be together with you and all the saints in glory everlasting. Amen. All right, see you next week. Oh, speaking of which, um, the, the class, is it after Christmas? Or is there a 28th? Is there a 25th, 26th? Yes, there must be a 28th. Maybe there is. I kind of hope not. I mean, none of us have to make it there. So no class on the Tuesday after Christmas Day. So, yeah, between Christmas and New Year's, i got to preach like a thousand times because Christmas is on a Saturday. So. Pastor Wells, what happened to all the...